Hello everyone, and welcome back to week one of Applied Immunology. This is lecture 1b, the first of three basic lectures for week one that will introduce us to a broad overview of the immune system. We'll begin with an introduction to the origins of immunology and how they fit into human history. We'll then try to answer the overarching question of why the immune system exists and why this arm of biology has been developed and selected for over the course of metazoan evolution. Understanding this will then help us learn how to apply our knowledge of the mechanisms of an immune response towards developing new treatments that improve human medicine. Lastly, we'll discuss the generic goals of a successful immune response on a very generalized and conceptual level. Now, as we work through each of these topics, please keep in mind that we will delve into many of these at a much higher level of detail in future lectures for this course. So if you come up with any questions throughout this introductory lecture, please just write them down so that you can refer to them later on as we start to work through this material at a higher level of depth. I like to begin this course with an introduction to the origins of immunology as a field of scientific study. If we go all the way back to about 430 BC, there was a historian named Thucydides who wrote extensive records about the Peloponnesian War in ancient Greece. Interestingly, these records included a focus on various plagues and infections that afflicted populations on both sides of the war, including the interesting observation that individuals who survived smallpox infection, this was about 70 to 80 percent of the people who were infected, never appeared to get reinfected with smallpox later on in life. So this was the first historical record of anyone observing the phenomenon of naturally acquired immunity to infection, where a patient who survives a primary infection with a given pathogen acquires immune memory that protects them from future reinfection with that same pathogen. Moving forward to 900 AD, we start seeing records of Chinese physicians practicing a medical procedure called variolation. In this procedure, patients would inhale a powder made of ground up smallpox scabs, <clears throat> and this would result in a very mild form of disease, where maybe about 2% of patients would still get full-blown small, smallpox infection and potentially die. But the patients who survived would be protected from future smallpox infection. This was the first form of vaccination, although the mechanisms underlying protection were still unknown. Although there was still some risk associated with variolation, a mortality rate of 1 to 2 percent was obviously a huge improvement over the 20 to 30 percent mortality rate that was observed with natural smallpox infection. So this was a huge medical advance over a deadly pathogen that had plagued humanity for centuries. The, su the success of variolation soon led to its spread to other cultures in India, Turkey, and Africa. In the 1700s, uh, the practice of variolation was imported to Europe. So Lady Montague was the wife of a British ambassador who was stationed in Constantinople, and while living there, she saw Turkish physicians regularly variolate patients against smallpox. She had the procedure performed on her own children while living in Turkey, and then upon return to England was responsible for conducting the first human study of subcutaneous variolation against smallpox. Notably, this was performed on a set of prisoners as well as abandoned children at an orphanage, which touches on obvious bioethics violations that are beyond the scope of this class. Nevertheless, although a small percentage of the patients still acquired severe infection and died, the obvious advantage of variolation over natural infection led to the procedure becoming widely used throughout Europe. A key advance from variolation was made a few decades later when an English physician named Edward Jenner made the interesting observation that dairy maids who worked with cows, which are commonly infected with a related pox virus named cowpox, would usually be infected by cowpox and this would uh, result in a non-lethal form of disease characterized by cowpox lesions on their hands. However, these women never appeared to get infected with smallpox later on in life. To test if cowpox infection conferred protection from smallpox, Edward Jenner inoculated an eight-year-old boy who was actually the son of his gardener with cowpox and then deliberately infected the child with smallpox several weeks later and found that the boy was protected from disease Again, this obviously violates several principles of modern-day bioethics. Now, since the pox virus species used in this case was named vaccinium, the procedure was therefore termed vaccination from here on out. And compared to variolation, vaccination had no risk of mortality. And as a much safer alternative that still provided equivalent protection, it replaced variolation as the primary preventative measure against smallpox by about 1840. Now, vaccination became a commonly accepted medical practice and was successful in protecting large portions of the population from infection with devastating illnesses such as smallpox. However, the biological mechanisms underlying the process of infection, how infections could be transferred between individuals, and how the mammalian body responded to infections were all major aspects of underlying biology that remained unknown at this point in history. 
This changed in the late 1800s when a scientist named Robert Koch performed a series of seminal experiments using Bacillus anthracis. This is a bacterium that produces anthrax toxin derived from infected cows. He established germ theory, which is a critical scientific theory underlying the field of infectious disease. Um, this theory states that microorganisms known as pathogens can be transferred between individuals and that these are responsible for causing clinical disease. This was a key advance in the field of microbiology and importantly ushered in a new era of research centered on understanding how the human body defends itself from these microorganisms. The understanding of germ theory next led to key studies aimed at understanding how the effects of vaccination were mediated. With the knowledge that certain pathogens led to disease, Louis Pasteur showed that dead bacteria, in this case cholera, could be used to vaccinate chickens and confer protection from live cholera infection. So using this information, he then developed the first vaccines against rabies and anthrax. Critical advances in our understanding of how vaccination confers protection from infection were next made by von Behring and Katasato, two scientists who independently showed that soluble factors isolated from the serum of mice previously infected with diphtheria could be injected into uninfected individuals and render them resistant to future diphtheria infection. Von Behring received the Nobel Prize for this work um, back in 1901. We now know that this is due to the transfer of a molecule called an antibody that's present in the blood. But at this point, it was one of the first demonstrations of immune system components being sufficient for protection. The nascent field of immunology was fully recognized by the beginning of the 1900s when Ilya Mechnikov and Paul Ehrlich made key discoveries that eventually led to them being awarded the Nobel Prize in medicine. Mechnikov had used microscopy to determine that certain cells were capable of phagocytosing particles and proposed that the engulfment of bacteria by phagocytes would kill these harmful microorganisms, and this is a theory termed cellular immunity. Meanwhile, Ehrlich defined antibodies as an essential molecule secreted by white blood cells that conferred immunity to either vaccinated or previously infected individuals, and this was a theory called humoral immunity. Although these two um, thoughts were considered competing theories at the time, we now appreciate that both types of responses make up critical arms of the host immune response used to kill infectious microbes. And so this pioneering work is commonly viewed as the basis of modern immunology. Looking at how immunology grew into its own field of study, I want to stress the fact that these key points are all centered upon the pursuit of improving human survival in the face of infectious disease, which has represented one of the greatest medical threats to mankind over the course of human history. As the field of immunology has grown, we've learned more about how humans and pathogens have co-evolved over evolutionary time. And it's become clear that the development of an immune system is a critical aspect of animal biology that promotes host fitness and survival. We can think of the immune system as having primarily evolved in order to protect the host from infection with harmful microorganisms, which represents an enormous selection pressure that has existed over the course of evolutionary time. It's also important to keep in mind that this must be accomplished while remaining ignorant or non-responsive to healthy tissues, which is a key concept referred to as immunological tolerance. With the advent of vaccines, we find that this biological system can be activated under controlled exposure conditions in a way that protects an individual from future infection. And importantly, this is accomplished without any of the risks of death or disfigurement associated with primary infection required for naturally acquired immunity. This is best exemplified through smallpox, which we discussed extensively in the last slide. To date, this is the only infectious disease to be completely eradicated by immunization, so the World Health Organization declared smallpox as globally eliminated shortly before 1980. Although other infectious diseases haven't been completely eradicated, this table on the bottom left summarizes the fact that they've been dramatically reduced with the advent of vaccines. Here we can see a variety of infectious diseases that often infected children and contributed to high rates of early childhood mortality and disablement through most of human history, which have been drastically reduced in the current era of modern medicine. In addition to antibiotics, which were also discovered and developed following the recognition and acceptance of germ theory, I would argue that vaccines represent one of the most powerful and important tools in the history of medicine and public health. The field of immunology and our understanding of how host immunity interacts with pathogens can really inform treatment strategies for a wide variety of diseases beyond infection. And this includes a form of dysregulated immunity called autoimmunity. 
This is a class of disorders caused by the improper activation of the immune system against healthy self tissues, which represents a breakdown in immunological tolerance. This is most directly exemplified by things like type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, lupus, and Crohn's disease. Interestingly, more recent research has implicated autoimmune contributions to several other pathologies, including obesity and cardiovascular disease, as well as neurodegenerative and neurological disorders, including Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and even narcolepsy. Now, we've covered a lot of information here, but I want to stress a key take-home point of studying immunology, which is that if we study and understand how the immune system works to promote host defense in healthy individuals, we can use this information to design novel therapies that harness the beneficial properties of immune activation while minimizing off-target tissue pathology or immunopathology. This is obviously demonstrated through the principles used to guide vaccine design to defend us against infectious diseases. Um, this is really relevant right now with the new SARS coronavirus vaccines, but also extends to therapies that are used to block immunopathology in settings where the immune system is inappropriately activated such as um, in the treatment of autoimmune disorders and allergic reactions, as well as to prevent tissue rejection following organ transplantation. Notably, these principles can be um, exploited to stimulate immune responses in settings where they've been suppressed, which is best demonstrated through the promising new field of cancer immunotherapy. We're going to discuss all of these concepts much more extensively throughout the rest of this course, but I hope that all of these points have helped establish why immunology is such an important field of study with really clear relevance to human medicine. As we learn about immune contributions to various types of pathologies, I want us to keep in mind five central goals of a successful immune response that are shared by most types of immune cells. In this diagram, we just have a generic immune cell A, though we'll start to fill in the blanks with more specific information throughout the rest of this course. For now, let's just consider the fact that this immune cell A needs to be able to respond to an entire universe's worth of potentially harmful microorganisms, which include things like viruses as well as bacteria and parasites. So how does the cell accomplish these goals? Step number one is to recognize or detect the pathogen. In this overly simplified diagram, I'm showing direct recognition of any of these classes of microbes using receptors that are expressed on the surface of the immune cell. Step number two is to respond to that detection by engaging signal transduction pathways that upregulate transcriptional response programs. This is typically accomplished through the activation of a transcription factor in the cell cytosol, which allows for its translocation into the nucleus, where it then induces expression of target genes, which are then translated into effector molecules. This process is viewed as conferring an activated status upon the immune cell. So throughout this course, I'll often refer to the quality of an immune cell as becoming activated in response to certain stimuli. I should also note that some immune activation pathways lead to the um, direct activation of pre-existing protein effectors that are already expressed in the cell, but in both cases the end result is the presence of effector molecules produced by an activated immune cell. Step number three is to deploy the effector mechanisms that have been engaged by activated immune cells in order to contribute to the killing of target pathogens. This can occur in one of two ways, either by the direct cytotoxic targeting of a microbe or through indirect communication with other immune cells that then in turn are sequentially responsible for killing the microbe. Now, once the pathogen is successfully eliminated by effector mechanisms that are engaged by the activated cell in step number three, step number four is to resolve inflammation and help return both the cell and the surrounding tissue to a healthy homeostatic baseline. And this is really important because a lot of inflammatory mechanisms that are employed by immune cells can cause off-target pathologies called immunopathologies, where you damage neighboring healthy tissue even though it isn't involved in the infection. So the resolution of inflammation is a critical step in a successful immune response, and this is accomplished by a variety of negative feedback mechanisms that are engaged by activated immune cells. Lastly, certain subsets of immune cells are capable of forming immune memory that can be used to protect the host from future episodes of infection with that same pathogen. So these types of immune cells actually go down a differentiation pathways upon activation that will let them form a stable, long-lived pool of cells that specifically recognize the pathogen that initiated an immune response in the first place. And these can be maintained over the course of an individual's lifetime. This is the basis of immunological memory, which underlies how things like vaccines work and is an extremely important component of the immune system in vertebrate animals. To summarize some key points from today, I want you to focus on this overall concept that the immune system has evolved to defend the host from infection, 
and that these activities need to be balanced by mechanisms that preserve healthy tissue. Again, this is the concept of immunological self-tolerance. We can accomplish this through a series of generalized goals of the immune response that are shared by most types of immune cells, involving detection, activation, the deployment of effector mechanisms, the resolution of inflammation, and um, with certain cell subsets, the formation of immunological memory. Next, I hope that this lecture has established why the study of these immunological processes can inform the design of therapies aimed at treating a vast variety of diseases, including vaccines used to prevent infections, pathologies where the immune system is apparently activated, such as autoimmunity, allergy, and transplantation rejection, and settings where the immune system needs to be reactivated, such as in tumor immunology. This wraps up our first lecture in this course, so please remember to watch the remaining two introductory lectures for week one, which cover categories of immune responses, as well as immune organs, which we refer to as lymphoid organs.